supercomputer systems in the in the world. But as you said, my interest in science is very broad. Uh, right now, I have projects uh, in cosmology, in neuroscience, and particle physics everywhere where uh, numerical tools are needed mainly. And right now, as I said, I'm in Tokyo and hosted by the newly started Riken Quantum Computing Center and also the Cluster for Pioneering Research. And I briefly worked during the pandemic uh, for an AI startup in Tokyo. And that was really nice uh, because I had a really amazing view from the office, which is better than this one here. Um, so um, let me actually give a broad introduction about the research topic that I want to talk about today, um, mainly if you're not familiar with uh, quantum gravity. So I would try to actually uh, ease into the topic. And as you definitely know about gravity uh, and Einstein's general relativity is uh, one of the most uh, studied theories. And it is what we use to describe space-time in, uh, in our universe. And you might not be aware of it, but you use it every day. It's at the core of GPS technology. So it's used for navigation, for communications, satellites. But even if it is a basically a century old theory, um, it's still able to make headlines in the news. And we have in the last decade seen some of the examples, for example, the discovery of gravitational waves in 2017, uh, which were produced uh, in the first event by the collision of two um, black holes. And even right now, uh, LIGO, who won the Nobel Prize for this, is detecting events uh, uh, as we speak, and even from neutron stars colliding with neutron stars and black holes. And actually, a year later, the discovery of gravitational waves, we have seen the first image of the black hole horizon uh, for a black hole that is actually at the center of our galaxy. So we have this amazing theory that can describe these very strange and mysterious things that are black holes. So um, we are definitely interested in this, in studying these uh, mysterious objects, the black holes. And, but we also have another theory, which is really good, and we also use it every day uh, as, as a quantum field theory uh, physicist, and that is the standard model of particle physics. This is a quantum field theory, so it's a theory of particles and their inter interactions. So it's a theory, uh, some, some sort of many body quantum system uh, following the rules of quantum mechanics. And it is different from a theory of gravity, where you're basically describing space time. So we have these two amazing theories. And from the standard model of particle physics, we know that uh, there is this uh, strange piece missing. And as even if we can actually describe the fundamental interactions of electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, we cannot describe with this theory the interaction of uh, that we feel with gravity. So we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. So we cannot put the um, space-time structure into the framework of quantum field theory in a um, consistent way. So uh, one of the biggest challenge for theoretical physicists is to come up with a quantum field theory description uh, so some sort of interactions between elementary particles of the uh, structure of space-time. So we would like to describe space-time as some sort of emergent property of microscopic degrees of freedom. And why, why do we want to do that? Well, let me give you uh, one of the most famous examples, which has to do with the information paradox, which is related to black holes again. So the information paradox uh, comes up because general relativity tells us that the black hole has a um, horizon. And if you pass this horizon, nothing can come out. So if you're thinking about information going into the horizon, this information is lost. But quantum mechanics uh, and quantum field theory says the information is actually conserved. There's, you shouldn't make it disappear. So, how can you reconcile these, these two aspects in these two different theories? 
And we have a clue now from 1972 that um, Stephen Hawking basically wrote a paper describing this quantum mechanical effect that can happen near the vicinity of the horizon of a black hole. And in that case, you actually can have some information escaping the black hole or looking like it's escaping the black hole. This is the famous Hawking's radiation. But still, even with Hawking's radiation and something is coming out of the black hole, there is still uh, not enough information to reconstruct what is going into the black hole. So what uh, quantum theory of gravity is trying to do is trying to relate the information that is going into the black hole and the information that is coming out through some sort of quantum entanglement. If we are able to somehow describe what is inside the black hole in terms of quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, then we might be able to actually recover the information through a quantum mechanical process. So a quantum theory of gravity uh, is our hope for solving this information paradox and it is the topic of uh, my talk today. So let me give you an outline of the uh, technical part of the talk that I will start right now. Um, I will introduce what these matrix models are and how they are connected to quantum gravity. And then I will describe numerical techniques for solving quantum mechanics of matrices. And in this case, I will start from the Hamiltonian and then I will describe how you can put this Hamiltonian on a quantum computer after some uh, truncation. Then I will describe a deep learning method and, and then I will benchmark this quantum computing and deep learning methods against uh, the typical technique that is used on supercomputers, which is path integral Monte Carlo. And this is basically what you do when you do lattice QCD, for example. And then I will finish with conclusions and challenges for the future. Okay, so the main motivation for matrix quantum mechanics is, as I said at the beginning, um, quantum gravity. And the relation between matrix quantum mechanics and quantum gravity is coming from the so-called holographic duality. This duality basically states um, in very simple words that a quantum field theory a theory of particles and interactions in some space time is actually equivalent in some sense to a gravitational theory, which is a theory of space time itself. But this theory is now in a lower dimensional uh, system. So this started with Juan Maldacena in 1997, and it's related to the idea of DP brains, which come from string theory. But in, uh, in the end, what you need to care about is that there is a way uh, to relate a quantum field theory, which is usually typically a gauge or supersymmetric quantum field theory with a theory of quantum gravity. So you can actually describe space time and properties of space time, like the geometry of a black hole in terms of microscopic degrees of freedom in a quantum field theory. And we are lucky because some of these supersymmetric quantum field theories can actually be dimensionally reduced. Typically they are higher dimensional in 10 or 11 dimensions, but they can actually be described as simple quantum mechanical systems of matrices. So we have a dictionary for going from one side of the duality to the other side of the duality. And today we will focus on the gauge or quantum field theory part of the duality. And if we are able to solve that theory, then we know that we can answer questions about quantum gravity. Okay, just to give you an example, uh, I'm not actually going to study this theory, but this is the most famous uh, matrix model or matrix quantum mechanics model. And it's the so-called BFSS model. It is a quantum mechanical theory of matrices, which is obtained from a supersymmetric theory of uh, young mills in 10 dimension. So when you take all the gauge degrees of freedom in this extra dimensional theory, and you compactify all the dimensions down to zero, and you're just left with time, so now you have just quantum mechanics, what you're left with is just an ensemble of matrices, uh, which are scalar degrees of freedom, which are interacting with each other. And then you have fermions, because this is a supersymmetric theory, which relates, again, fermions to bosons degrees of freedom, 
and then you have a gauge degrees of freedom as well. And you can think of these big matrices just as some uh, interactions. And in the original picture where this uh, BFSS model corresponds to the low energy dynamics and is conjectured to represent M theory, which is our best hope for a quantum uh, mechanical theory of gravity, then the diagonal elements of these matrices uh, correspond to the coordinates of um, this, these zero brain objects, which make a black hole. And the off diagonal elements correspond to interactions between these D zero brain objects, which are mediated by open strings. So this is just a picture that uh, this is typical for these matrix quantum mechanics systems. But in general, you have to think about these quantum mechanical systems as some many body system described by matrices, which in some limit, they correspond to quantities uh, of quantum gravitational uh, objects like black holes. What we want to do is solve this theory. For example, calculate expectation values of observables like the energy of this system here, or for example, compute the wave function of the ground state for this uh, system. And in order to do that, we can use numerical methods. And the typical method that is applied is using high performance computing simulations of the path integral. Uh, you discretize this um, temporal dimension uh, using a lattice, and then you just sample all the possible quantum mechanical paths using Monte Carlo sampling. And for that, you can use, for example, a supercomputer. And here I'm showing the new top 500 number one supercomputer in the world, which is the, hosted by Riken, and it's called Fugaku, which basically is another name for the Mount Fuji, the volcano near Tokyo. Uh, this method um, is very powerful, but it has limitations. Uh, one of the limitations is that you cannot study problems that have a, uh, systems that have a sign problem. In other words, if you cannot write your sampling with a probability distribution given by the action, maybe because you have, for example, a complex action, then you cannot use this method. But another restriction is that um, if you want access to the wave function, to the actual state uh, of your system in, um, in quantum mechanics, you cannot do that uh, with, uh, with this method. And actually for quantum mechanical uh, systems related to quantum gravity, we do wanna know what the wave function is because the wave function will encode properties like entanglement, for example, and this is related to the information paradox that I described at the beginning. Okay, with these challenges, we will try to explore, um, with the challenges in mind, we will try to explore new methods um, related to quantum computing and deep learning, where you can actually represent the wave function in some specific representation given, for example, by qubits on a quantum computer or using deep neural networks in a deep learning uh, method. And we will try to compute the ground state wave function for some of these matrix models using uh, these methods. Uh, you're probably familiar with quantum technologies. Um, now we have um, 50 qubits digital quantum computers based on, on a variety of technologies from superconducting qubits to photonics. And here I'm showing um, the Sycamore uh, Google chip uh, with 54 qubits. And there's also IBM quantum uh, new systems. And we expect from these companies to have about 1000 qubits um, ready in, in the following few years. At least there is a roadmap for that. And this has opened up uh, many new avenues in both scientific research and for nuclear physics and for quantum gravity, like I'm gonna show and for quantum machine learning and industrial applications, solving optimization problems and uh, all sort of um, financial market studies. But for me, this is interesting uh, because we know that nature is quantum mechanical and we could hope to simulate more complex and larger systems um, in a faster way using quantum computing advantages. Uh, just briefly, uh, probably there's no need for this, but um, 
at the basis of quantum technologies, we have the uh, qubit unit, which is the equivalent of the classical bit in classical information. And a qubit can be in a superposition of two states. And when you put many qubits together, you can have entanglement and you can store more um, complete information of quantum mechanical systems. And everything is governed by complex amplitudes, which can then be transformed into probability distributions and uh, following some measurements. So this is what we will use for our um, quantum mechanics of matrices. But um, these systems are still limited. So let's try to first look at some prototypes, some small systems of matrix quantum mechanics. And in our paper, we studied two specific uh, systems uh, from the easier to the harder one. And the first one, the easier one is a bosonic model. This is not supersymmetric, so it's just a test to see how well we can do with, uh, with these methods. And the uh, second one is actually supersymmetric. So this is related to some of those theories which have some dual gravitational descriptions. So in this theory, uh, we have a Hamiltonian that describes the energy and the interactions among the different objects. We have physical states that are invariant under an SUN gauge symmetry. And we can write the operators um, in a basis of the generators of the SUN group. So we can have up to D different matrices X, and we can have N square minus one uh, degrees of freedom for each matrix related to the gauge symmetry. When we have a supersymmetric model, in addition to the bosonic part, which is still there, we also have uh, fermionic degrees of freedom. And this fermionic degrees of freedom, again, can be decomposed in a basis of generators of SUN. So we're going to have n squared minus one of them. Now, the bosonic model is quite simple. You can think of it as a free Hamiltonian, uh, which is basically a collection of harmonic oscillators. And then an interaction part, which has a quartic interaction, where you can have uh, connections or interactions between all the different matrices in this system, governed by some strength given by G squared. On the supersymmetric model, in addition to those bosonic interactions, we also have interactions between bosons and fermions. And we also have some constant term, which is just there to set the energy to zero. Now, one of the challenges for quantum technologies is that the numerical methods that we can apply on a quantum computer, the quantum algorithms, only work on a limited number of qubits. So if we only have a limited number of qubits, we can only describe a specific set of states. And in this case, we cannot take arbitrarily many matrices or look at arbitrarily large um, SUN gauge groups. Because, for example, in this case, um, we're going to have too many degrees of freedom that cannot be mapped into qubits. So to make an example of a small scale system, let me fix the gauge group to SU2. So we have three generators. And then let me fix the number of matrices to two. So this is the smallest non-trivial example of this theory. If I expand out all my matrices, we can look at this Hamiltonian over here where the index i goes from one to two, and then the index alpha of the color degree of freedom goes from one to three. And you can think of this as a many body system of scalars of bosons um, on six different sides because of these combinations of i and alpha. And there are sites corresponding to matrix i equal one and matrix i equal two. And there are very interesting symmetries here. When, when there is no coupling constant and there is no interaction, then this is a free system. And you have six um, harmonic oscillators that don't talk to each other. So you actually have uh, permutation symmetry. Um, can you still see my uh, screen? Yep. Yes. OK, good because I cannot. 
Okay, here it is. But um, this permutation symmetry actually goes away when you start cranking up the interaction strength. And now G square is larger than zero. And this happens because now you have interactions that take one matrix to talk to the other ones from one group to the other. And you still have a symmetry, which is the one um, which happens when you exchange matrix I equal one with matrix I equal two. So now your, your generic symmetry is group is smaller. So while you know that uh, when G square equals zero, uh, the ground state is the vacuum, it's like all the harmonic oscillators are just gonna stay in the lowest energy possible. So it's the uh, zero state for each of them. And then you just have a tensor product of them. If you crank up the interactions, you don't know um, in which ground state you're going to end up with. So this is the question that we are trying to answer as a first step is understanding the ground state structure of this um, bosonic model and supersymmetric model when the interaction strength is large. So those are the most relevant for uh, quantum for quantum gravity. Okay, one of the challenges right now for understanding this ground state here as an example is for the six boson case n equal two and d equal two is that each of these bosons can be in an infinitely large number of states from zero to infinity. Um, so in order to put this theory on a quantum computer with limited resources, we also have to truncate the Hilbert space uh, of each of these bosons. So what we'll do is we'll, of course, have uh, the lowest excitation modes, and then we will allow each of these degrees of freedom only to get up to a certain uh, excitation level, let's say, which is given by a cutoff lambda in this Hilbert space. So you're only gonna have lambda levels in each um, harmonic oscillator, and they will be interacting with each other when the coupling constant G square is larger than zero. And your goal is to find the ground state uh, or this wave function, this amplitude, which correspond to a specific assignment of these levels, which is the lowest energy state. Now, of course, the physical results that we are interested in are at lambda equal infinity. The original Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. So we would have to do some sort of extrapolation uh, and, and see how or if the results even converge given the algorithm that we decide to use for finding the ground state. Okay, so the easiest algorithm that we can think of, uh, and it's going to actually be the first benchmark that we have, is actually exactly diagonalizing the Hamiltonian to find the smallest eigenvalue, which is the ground state energy, and its eigenvector, which is the ground state wave function. So we can do this, because we are looking at a small scale system, n equal two and d equal two. So we only have six uh, different degrees of freedom, but it's still going to be computationally intensive as we go to larger and larger uh, cutoffs lambda. We do this using the Q-tip um, framework, which is a software developed uh, by our group here at RICAN. And we study the convergence of the system to lambda equal infinity. This is an example of the ground state energy E0, which is just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian calculated on the eigenstate uh, of the lowest eigenstate. We can do this uh, for many values of the cutoff lambda and also different values of the coupling to see if uh, this convergence can actually hold. And we see that it actually holds and that it is um, exponentially fast. So we reach a convergent answer for the ground state energy um, exponentially fast in lambda. Then we, and this is the first result that we observe for this system. And then we study what happens to uh, the gauge invariance of our ground state. We expect that the ground state 
uh, is gauge invariant, but um, it's, this is a not a guarantee uh, in general. And so in order to study if the system uh, in the ground state is gauge invariant, we test this relation and we check if the um, operator that gives the um, Casimir of the gauge group on the state is zero. In, on the vacuum, it is zero, but what happens to the generic uh, lowest eigenstate is, uh, is not a priori known. And we can see that the, um, the zero, so this me measure of the breaking of gauge symmetry on the um, eigenstate of the lowest energy is actually exponentially close to zero as we increase the truncation uh, level lambda. And this is true for all the different coupling constants that we study. So even at strong coupling, we can go, uh, we can find a state, a ground state that is gauge invariant um, if lambda is large enough. We also tested a different approach, um, which is to perturb the energy of the system H with a term that is proportional to this G square operator. And the energy then is increased if the system is not a gauge singlet, because then this expectation value here would be non-zero. And we show here um, a test that the energy of the system H in the ground state actually does not change if you include this um, term in the perturbed Hamiltonian. But what changes when you go from the eigenvalue of H, which I was showing before, to the eigenvalues of H prime that are here in orange, is only the bare amount of gauge symmetry breaking. But for the uh, smallest, uh, lowest states in the system, starting from the ground state to the first excited states and so forth, the energy is not affected. Only the energy of non gauge singlet is affected, and they are removed from the low energy spectrum through this penalty term. Now, once we have done this benchmark using exact diagonalization, we know what answer we expect for this system. And now we can start moving on to the actual quantum computer and quantum algorithm to see if we can get the same results. In this case, in this case we have a limited number of qubits. So we will study a small number of um, cutoff lambdas. And if we start from a truncation level lambda equal to two, what we are actually doing is we are giving a single boson to a qubit. Or in other words, a boson now only have, has two levels. So it is like a qubit. And in total, for this system with six bosons, we can use six qubits. And this is an example of a, of a quantum circuit uh, with six qubits and some gates applied to each qubit, including some entanglement gates, like C0 gates. And what you should uh, look at here is that you start with a state where all the qubits, for example, are in the zero state. And after applying a certain um, chain of gates to these qubits, you end up with a state psi, which we would like to represent the wave function. So if we write our quantum algorithm and these quantum gates in the correct order and in the correct way, we will be able to reproduce the wave function of the ground state, starting from the zero state on all qubits. If we now increment the truncation level and we go to lambda equal four, so now we have four levels for each uh, boson. Now each boson needs two qubits in order to reach four different levels, okay? So we need to use 12 qubits. So now things become more complicated. We have larger number of qubits and we can have more gates connecting them. And you can see easily that if we move to larger truncation levels, you will need even more qubits. And the scaling is, is here now. It's this uh, log of lambda to the six because we have this uh, six degrees of freedom. And you quickly get um, out of resources um, on, on 
normal quantum computers. The quantum computers that you can access, for example, in the cloud through IBM um, quantum experience are 20 qubits. So you will be limited to this Lambda equal eight, even for this smaller system. So what we actually did um, for the quantum algorithm, we focused on only the smallest truncation levels, and we didn't have enough resources to go to the uh, Lambda equal eight truncation level. But still, you know what you should do um, to put this uh, theory on a quantum computer. You have your Hamiltonian, and given the size of the Hilbert space, you can write this as a matrix that acts on your states. And then you can write your operators acting on these states, um, depending on the size of the qubits, or the number of qubits. And it's easy to actually write this um, X um, operators in terms of annihilation operators over uh, states of each harmonic oscillator or matrix. And you can do this for one qubit per boson, where you have a two by two matrix, or two qubits per boson, where you have a four by four matrix, and so forth. So this is known. Uh, there is a procedure for this, which is automated. And everything is coded up using the Qiskit framework from IBM, which allows you to write um, a Hamiltonian in some matrix form and then transform it into a series of um, operation acting on a state that is represented by qubits. So once we can build this matrix and map it to qubits, um, we are good to go for any quantum algorithm. The quantum algorithm that we decide to use is a very famous one, is the variational quantum eigensolver. And it was originally uh, developed uh, for quantum chemistry. And it's been actually used a lot in quantum chemistry where it has uh, very many applications and it can reach very nice results. And it is useful because it allows us to still get good and reliable answers on near-term quantum devices, which are uh, still noisy and don't have, um, they're not fault tolerant and they only have limited uh, error correction methods. This method is a variational method and it basically works uh, in three simple steps. You start by devising a parameterized quantum circuit similar to the one that I was showing in the slide before, where you have a list of qubits and some gates. But now these gates are not fixed, but are parameterized by some parameters. It can be angles of rotations of single qubits, or can be some other more complicated combination. And this represents a variational ansatz for the state, because as I said before, if you start with the qubits in the zero state and you apply some gates, you end up with your uh, state. And you want that state to be the wave function. So a parameterized quantum circuit is a variational form of your state. And then what the quantum computer is doing is applying those gates and then measuring the energy, the Hamiltonian expectation value on those quantum qubits on those states. This is equivalent to evaluating a cost function that you want to minimize, because we are interested in the energy of the ground state and the corresponding um, state vector. This can be done through an optimization procedure, because now we have an energy landscape for each set of parameters theta, and we can find the minimum in this landscape, that, which correspond to um, uh, lowest energy state. So at the end of this procedure, you end up with a variational energy estimate for the energy. And this is typically an upper bound for the true um, ground state energy. So this is what we are after uh, using the VQE algorithm. So what do we do practically for the matrix model? So let me start with just six qubits. First, first step, we choose a variational ansatz, which is a parameterized quantum circuit. And this parameterized quantum circuit acting on six qubits can take um, any form that you like. Um, and in this case, we choose 
a form like the one here on the slide, where you have some rotations of each qubit along one axis, parameterized by some angle. And all the rotation gates applied to these qubits have different angles. In this case, um, you have 12 parameters because you have rotations here, you have CNOT gates here, and then you have, again, rotations at the end. And this is an ANSAS that we call uh, of depth equal to 1, because what we can do is increase the depth by just repeating, uh, by adding basically layers that look the same um, along the chain of the quantum circuit. So this circuit has now depth 3 and has more parameters, 24. And it's deeper, which means you can probably access uh, different states at the end than if you were just to stop at depth equal one. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is better. So when we choose a variational ansatz, we are in some sense restricting the um, Hilbert space that we can span because we only have a limited number of um, operations that we can do on qubits. This uh, ansatz can be started from an arbitrary initial point with an arbitrary value of, for example, the 24 parameters. And we actually run this algorithm multiple times uh, for different initial points because we are exploring this energy landscape in this higher dimensional parameter space. And we want to make sure that we are actually getting uh, always to the same minimum, irrespective of the initial point. Then we have to choose a uh, quantum simulator or a quantum device itself in order to measure the energy with a quantum mechanical uh, process. And in order to do a first step, uh, we actually don't use quantum hardware because quantum hardware still presents some challenges related to noise. Uh, and we just use the simplest non-noisy uh, simulator that we have, which is the so-called state vector simulator, which basically amounts to doing linear algebra on, on these qubits. So you have matrices acting on vectors and just doing uh, operations. And then we have to choose the third step, which is the optimizer, which allows us to find the optimal value of theta. And we can choose, um, this is a classical step, so we can choose any classical optimizer that, that we like. And we just try to benchmark a few of them, and, but usually they perform uh, pretty well, and we just see small differences in, in some cases. And this is a classical optimization, which we run iteratively for a number of steps. OK, let me show you um, first plot of results. And here on the plot, what I'm showing is the energy of the ground state after or along the trajectories of the BQE optimization. So for different number of iterations, you can see the energies lowering and reaching a plateau, which is very close to the exact value given by the exact diagonalization method for this value of the cutoff. So here we have a Hamiltonian truncation scheme with lambda equal 2. We did the exact diagonalization. We know the answer is 3.148. And we actually get very, very close to that number using the BQE. And we check different types of variational forms using either uh, rotations around the y-axis or rotations around the y-axis and the z-axis as well. And we don't see significant differences. And also the different algorithms, they are able to reach this ground state energy for this system, even though some of them takes longer than others. And now we move to lambda equal four. So now we have 12 qubits and we can still actually do a pretty good job at getting towards the uh, exact value. And again, we see some algorithms converging faster than others. But you see, again, we can reach very um, close number to the exact result. OK, what I'm showing here is a small uh, interaction strength. And what happens when the interaction strength goes up 
um, is actually shown in these plots. And if we fix the variational ansatz, so the parameterized quantum circuit doesn't change, when the coupling constant is larger, 0, 5, 1, or 2, the VQE is struggling to find the same energy for the ground state as the exact diagonalization method. And this difference is actually increasing with the coupling. Because at large coupling, we do know that there is going to be more interactions and the wave function is going to be more complicated. And it's possible that a fixed parameterized quantum circuit like the one shown here does not allow us to get a really good representation of the state. This is even more true in the supersymmetric case. The supersymmetric is an even harder problem. We have fermionic degrees of freedom, bosonic degrees of freedom, and they're all interacting. And at large coupling, it becomes really challenging to get the same uh, value as the exact result. And in this case, the exact result is actually zero. The energy of the ground state is zero when lambda is equal to infinity because of supersymmetry. So this is a very good benchmark for us. We already, we already know the answer without even doing the calculation. Uh, but at fixed uh, truncation level, like lambda equal to, we know that we shouldn't get zero. There are, uh, we are breaking supersymmetry doing this truncation, but we do expect something of the order of 0 0.016. And we actually don't get very close if our uh, variational ansatz, our parameterized quantum circuit doesn't get deep enough. So we need more gates in order to be able to represent a ground state that is closer to the, the real one, the true one. So the, there is a good big difference actually between a system of depth equal to five and a system of uh, depth equal to nine, where we have our best results. Okay, that's all for the uh, quantum algorithm. But when we move to deep learning, we are actually doing something very similar to what I just described. So the deep learning method is, is not going to be completely different. You're actually going to be able to understand this um, if you have understood the VQE. Again, we are doing a variational method. And again, we have these same three steps that we used for the quantum algorithm. The first step is to choose a variational ansatz. So we choose a parameterization of the wave function, but instead of using a quantum circuit, we use a neural network. So we use the neural network as an approximation of the function defining the complex amplitude for the system. So this picture is from this uh, the first paper using this published in Science in 2017, which is showing a convolutional neural network applied to some spin lattice model, where you given a spin configuration with spin up and spin down on different lattice sites, you can apply a, a convolutional network to obtain a wave function at the end. So just a scalar function of this configuration. The second step is to choose a Monte Carlo sampling, you have to compute an expectation value, this one here, for the energy, because that is what you're trying to minimize. And you can just rewrite this as a Monte Carlo estimate for this integral. So you're computing the expectation value of this quantity here with x sampled according to this probability distribution. And the probability distribution is what you expect from the wave function. And then you choose how to optimize your parameters. So you choose your learning algorithm. And you can choose, for example, a stochastic gradient descent method where you calculate gradients and then you move towards the, the minimum of your landscape. OK, here, the first step is to choose a variational ansatz as a neural uh, architecture. So these are called neural quantum states. It's a, the um, equivalent of a quantum circuit, a parameterized quantum circuit. But instead of using quantum states on qubits, you just use uh, neural networks functions. So you parameterize your wave function, which is a complex amplitude with a magnitude and a phase. 
And if you just focus, for example, on the magnitude, you can write it as, as a probability distribution or some amplitude with some parameters, theta. We decide to use a specific type of parameterization for this probability distribution of X, which is modeled using an autoregressive flow. What an autoregressive flow does is it's basically uh, factorizing this probability distribution in a pieces that only depend on one variable at a time. And the successive uh, probability distributions depend only on the previous ones. So P of X2 only depends on X1, P of X3 only depends on X2 and X1 and so forth. And this parameterization is given by this F function here, which is actually itself a neural network. So what it ends up doing is that you can start from a very simple distribution, like a Gaussian distribution, and through change of variables, you can actually obtain an arbitrarily complex distributions for your variable P of X1. So this P of X1 is going to have some parameters F, which are actually themselves given by neural networks. So this is, uh, these are so-called uh, normalizing flows. And in this specific autoregressive setting, what, ha what it happens is that you don't have a truncation level lambda like before. You don't have to specify the states. You actually have access to any value of x uh, in a continuous uh, scale, which is what we would like. And also, you can do sampling from this probability distribution here. For example, the square of this is just this p of theta very, very fast because of this autoregressive property where you only depend on the previous variables in some order. With that in mind, the entire process now looks um, very simple. Once you have your parameterized uh, wave function with some parameters theta, in this case, we only have six variables. So these people use these normalizing flows or uh, generative models to actually estimate the density or probability of images with millions of pixels. We are doing it with just six or with a vector of six numbers. So this is actually pretty easy in terms of what this uh, architecture can do, which is very powerful. But for us, the process is pretty simple. Once we have this, we evaluate the energy by sampling from this distribution. And we can do sampling very fast and obtain an expectation value for the energy. And then we can tune these parameters theta and find the optimal value, which is the minimum of the energy. And once we do that, the wave function represented by this probability distribution of parameters theta star is going to be the actual ground state wave function for us. So how does this method perform on this small case system? And bear in mind that here we have this parameterization with a neural network, so we can actually change this architecture and increase, for example, the number of hidden units, the number of layers. And we find that um, there is a point at which things don't improve anymore. And if we set the number of hidden layer units to 20 uh, times the variables that we have, we can actually get results that are compatible within the stochastic estimate due to the sampling to the exact results even at large couplings. And this was not possible with the VQE. OK, after we have shown these methods that are new, we should actually check if the answer is correct uh, using path integral Monte Carlo method. Because in some cases, you can actually not perform the exact diagonalization. For SU2 and two matrices, you can do it. But for SU3, uh, the matrix that you have to diagonalize is already very big. And you cannot calculate the energies with exact diagonalization. So for that, we would need to use the typical methods of the path integral, uh, even though they can only give us the expectation value of the energy, and they cannot give us the wave function. But still, we would like to check that the energy is the same. 
And what you do when you put a quantum field theory on a lattice is that you discretize space and time. And in quantum mechanics, you only discretize uh, time. And you keep all these degrees of freedom. So you have scalars, fermions, and bosons. So you're not simplifying it by changing the theory. It's the entire theory. And then you do Monte Carlo sampling on supercomputers. And you can quantify your errors by uh, sampling uh, for longer or by checking, for example, that you are able to converge to uh, lattice spacing that goes to zero. So you can compute expectation values by sampling from the path integral, but you have to extrapolate to the continuum limit. So the challenge here is not the truncation level, um, but it is another sort of truncation level given by the discretization of time for us. So here is a, an example for this small scale system where we already know the answer, but just to, just to show you that we have to check the energy at different values of the lattice spacing. And the lattice spacing is actually defined by a combination of the temperature of this theory that is put on the lattice and by the actual number of lattice sites that you decide to put on your grid. And then the energy is computed and it has error bars because of the stochastic evaluation of the Monte Carlo sampling, but they're very small and you actually don't see them on this scale. And then you extrapolate towards zero. And we did several extrapolations uh, using different order polynomials because that's the form that we expect uh, for the continuum limit for a going to zero. And we can actually see good agreement uh, if we fit, for example, the smallest lattice spacing only. But if we try to fit all the lattice spacings that we have simulated with a linear function, of course, we get uh, very bad results. So we know that we should use some, for example, second order polynomial and fit um, at least a reasonable amount of data. So all these fits are actually pretty good with good quality. And then we know what the energy is with an error bar. We also can try different extrapolations, for example, by first fixing the temperature and then um, extrapolating in the number of lattice sites. But we should get an equivalent answer. And that's what we see, um, even though we have larger error bars. So for the final answer of this method, we choose this global extrapolation uh, point. For example, this one here is orange one. And then we want to compare all the different methods. For the ground state energy, and for a system with two matrices, we can do the uh, exact diagonalization for n equal two. But for example, already we cannot do it at n equal three. And for that, we will rely on the results of the Monte Carlo path integral method, which does not, uh, is not actually influenced by the gauge group um, you just have to run for a little longer, but there is uh, no practical issue when you have a larger gauge group. And even larger number of matrices uh, don't really uh, make a difference for this method. And that is similar to the situation for the deep learning. You just have to train for longer uh, because you have more variables, but you can actually use this method for larger gauge, group, gauge groups, no problem. On the other hand, the VQE is restricted by the amount of qubits that we have. We only try two and four uh, cutoff levels, which amount to six qubits and 12 qubits. But already n equal to three requires too many qubits for us to actually get a meaningful answer. And the problem is more uh, severe for the supersymmetric model. But uh, we actually do know the answer in the supersymmetric case. And the answer is uh, zero for this energy in the infinite cutoff limit. Uh, these are the results just compiled in, in tables and compared to each other. For different strength, interaction strength in the bosonic case and the supersymmetric case, and for gauge group SU2 and gauge group SU3. In the case of SU3, we don't have the exact diagonalization method or the VQE because they require too many resources. So we know that if we try to go to large n, um, we should actually stick to the deep learning method for now, because the uh, resources 
are still limited on quantum computers. But the uh, machine learning method, DL here, is actually in agreement with the results from Monte Carlo. So we know it's performing very well in this case. And even in the supersymmetric case, the deep learning model is able to give you an answer that is zero, which is the correct answer um, within the error bars. And it is struggling as we go to larger gauge coupling because the wave function is becoming more complicated. And then you probably need to adjust your variational neural network in order to get a better variational answer. OK, let me conclude. What I hope I convince you is that you can use quantum simulations and deep learning techniques to actually address some sort of quantum gravity problems, at least um, on a small scale like the one I described, using the holographic duality. So this duality is allowing us to compare quantum field theories with um, quantum gravitational systems. So if we can study quantum field theories with quantum computers, then we can actually hope to solve a quantum gravity problem. And on current quantum hardware, we can use hybrid quantum classical algorithms like the BQE uh, for small size matrix models. So it, they scale well with Lambda, but they require more um, qubits as you have more matrices or larger gauge groups. So we need to work uh, in order to go to larger systems. We need to work a bit more. Uh, but we know that within two years, we might have 1,000 qubits uh, pro processors. So we are looking forward to that. And on the deep learning side, we can do very fast sampling from generative models, which efficiently represent the complex amplitude of the ground state of these systems. Even in the supersymmetric case, uh, which is really difficult to do uh, otherwise, we can get um, a good um, representation of the ground state. Uh, some work to do for the future is to find a better efficient uh, parameterized quantum circuit in the case of the supersymmetric matrix model, because we know uh, the variational ansatz circuits that we tried were not really good unless we went to very deep circuits. And very deep circuits are not ideal on real quantum hardware because they are affected by more noise. There is actually a big industry right now in how to construct these uh, parameterized quantum circuits for specific problems. And the reason why the VQE works really well um, in quantum chemistry is because people really work hard on finding the correct representation in terms of uh, quantum circuits. Uh, we can also actually use machine learning or tensor network techniques to simplify the quantum simulations. So since we have limited resources, maybe there is a way using these tools to simplify the circuits and still get a good answer uh, for these matrix models. And we know that in the future, we should look at uh, techniques for error mitigation uh, when we run the circuits on real quantum hardware. Thank you very much. Thanks, Enrico. That was an, uh, <clears throat> um, a quite interesting talk. So let's get started with the Q&A session. So if you have a question, just uh, unmute yourself or just type it in the um, chat window. Dean. Thank you, Enrico. That was great. You, you, you covered like three different methods, all sort of cutting edge stuff, which is great. Yeah. Um, I, I did have a question, a, a couple questions. So when you do the VQE and you use yeah. some ansatz for the unitary transformations to prepare the wave function, do you yes. preserve gauge invariance with those transformations or are you breaking no. gauge invariance? We break gauge invariance. Yeah. OK. Um, and uh, which is? What we do also uh, in the in the exact diagonalization case, I mean, it's not imposed anywhere. Yeah. Okay. The other question I had was with okay. So uh, I was just looking at your paper. So as n increases, the dimensionality is incredibly fast. It's like two to yeah, the n squared, n squared yeah. minus one, right? Yeah. Or lambda to the uh, yeah, it's similar. 
So, um, but so so that's why the direct calculation from Hamiltonian truncation breaks down so quickly. Yeah, you have very big vectors and very big sparse matrices, and yeah. even if you use the best systems, I mean, at some yeah. point you run out of memory. Yeah. So I wanted to understand then, in that case, how do you do the training for the deep learning? How do you actually calculate anything? It's all stochastically done. Right. So in terms of the deep learning, you're not uh, truncating the Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. So if you have, let's say in this case, if you have two matrices and you have SU4, okay, you have four times two, sorry, four square minus one, which is 15 times two, which is 30. Okay, so you have 30 variables. So you have a vector of 40, of 30. You don't have a vector of 1 million, which is the, the quantum state. I, I see because because of the truncation, you, it, it changes the game. The truncation gives you lambda to the uh, two n square minus one, which is really bad because lambda. <laughs> we need lambda of eight, about eight or nine, to converge. Okay. So then you have eight to the power of thirty. That's big. But if you don't have lambda, then you just have thirty variables. So the neural network acts on a vector of 30 real numbers. Mm -hmm. It's very different from, from what we're doing with, with matrices here. OK. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. There's a question in the chat. Uh, was depth three the deepest ansatz? Uh, right. We actually did not run the circuit on real hardware. We used the simulator. And even with the simulator, which has no noise, we saw that in some cases, deep depth equal three was not enough to reach the, the ground state energy uh, from exact diagonalization. So you want to use a shorter or shallower circuits because of noise. But for this system, those shorter uh, system, um, parameterized quantum circuits don't give you the correct uh, energy. So yeah, we actually wanted to understand the structure of the variational ansatz and how many layers we would need before we move to the quantum hardware. Because if we see that we need depth equal 10 every time, then we, we're probably hopeless on real quantum hardware unless we use some specific techniques for error mitigation. Uh, Andrea has a question. No, cannot hear you. Yeah, you can also type in the chat if you want. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. There you go. Well, thanks, for, thanks for the talk. First of all, it's, it's great to see you. Yeah, um, nice to you. I wanted to ask you something about, about the continuum limit. When you, when you change, when you say this is a lattice spacing, what, what, yes. exactly what do you mean? So is there, is there a physical quantity that you use to fix this or is some sort of uh, number of points divided by the size of the box or? Right, so the lattice spacing is um, given by the temperature that it's one over T times the number of lattice sites. So the temperature, which is the inverse of the length of the circle, in this case, we only have one periodic dimension. So that temperature is uh, one over A times NT. So A times NT is your physical length. And we just want to send this lattice spacing to zero for each temperature, for example. And then if the temperature is small enough, you actually do not see any difference between uh, the different temperatures as you go to the continuum limit. But so, so practically, you're, you're increasing the number of points in the T, in the T direction, yes. essentially, or? Essentially, that's, that's the only thing we're doing, yes. OK, thanks.
more questions? So I've got one. So on one slide, you show different layers and then the extrapolation to Lambda goes to infinity. Um, layers of the parameterized quantum circuits or? I think so. It's uh, on slide. Um... Wait, uh, are you interested in the extrapolation to the infinite truncation? Yes, right. Ah, okay. Then it's this one here. Ah, uh, 39. Yeah, it should be this one here. This? Yeah, or, or the slide before. So um, basically two questions. So um, in, my understanding is that, so this lambda is, uh, is dimensionalized, right? Yes, it's just okay. a number of uh, excitations. So, so I was on, on, a, on the previous slide, you showed those uh, different layers. And uh, when, when this point in, in your talk, I was wondering, um, uh, so this lambda should somehow depend on the qubits, right? So uh, in, on a real quantum computing device, yes. the qubits will set a maximum lambda, lambda that, you, that you can use in yes. calculations. And then later you, you showed the equation, right? So it's, uh, I believe it's just the, Log base uh, log, to, uh, uh, yes. of lambda, lambda to the power of the number of the, the degrees of freedoms, right? Correct. That's correct. Okay. Yes. So, um, okay. So, so that, that that question is is answered. But I was wondering on, on the also on the next slide where you showed the uh, convergence. I mean, yes. this this looks like a rapid uh, convergence, but uh, relatively speaking. But uh, just looking at the scale. Uh, so depending on the unit of this uh, e naught, uh, I mean, this is extremely rapid, right? So I mean, it's the it's, it's third digit or so, right? It's the exponential. If you if you look, um, I, I don't have it here, but it's in the paper. If you compute the difference between lambda, a lambda value and the next one, so lambda plus one, this difference goes to zero exponentially fast. Right, uh, I understand. So, relatively speaking, I understand that. But just looking at on the, the 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 scale on the y-axis, right? So it, it does not change much, uh, I believe, right? It's it's right. like the third so digit. If, you, if you're happy with a specific precision, you can choose to stop at a smaller lambda, and that will set the number of qubits that you need to use. For example. Mm -hmm. so, so I mean, you, essentially, you can stop at two, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. So here at uh, larger coupling, it becomes uh, you know wider yeah, yes. because it's harder. But let's say that you're happy with this difference here. So you can stop at seven or let's say, yeah, stop at eight because then the next step would be, the difference would be smaller than the precision that you care about. Okay, then you can stop at eight. And for this, uh, that means you need 16 qubits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 16. Uh, so, but then, yeah. Sorry, but then that means that existing uh, quantum computing devices are not a limitation of the number of qubits available. Is 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 not a limitation, at least not for for these calculations, right? Exactly. So the the first step, this study of the convergence, is the first thing you need to know, and it's actually not a priori guaranteed by any means. You actually don't know how this will scale with the cutoff. Mm -hmm. So this is a very favorable scaling because given a specific coupling, you know that you can, you don't need an exponentially large number of qubits. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thanks. And uh, just in a few sentences perhaps, so both in your review paper uh, and uh, on uh, several of your slides, you, you uh, are referring to uh, your GitHub repository. So is there mm -hmm. some, Good starting point that you can recommend to just play with with, with the code and and uh, those calculations. So they are all doing the same things. So I would start from the exact diagonalization, and I would actually recommend using Qtip because it's very convenient. <laughs> it has objects for all operators and uh, and states, and also can do uh, time evolution. Mm -hmm. And there are notebooks with tutorials with fully commented examples. So it will basically 
take you through the entire paper by reading the notebook. OK. Uh, thanks. Last question, a uh, simple one. So uh, in the intro part of your talk, you, you showed uh, uh, this nice slide with, with Schrodinger's uh, cat. Yes. So uh, is there a deeper meaning behind this second cat in green uh, right next to Hawking's radiation? Right. The meaning here is that the cat is some sort of information. So it's the particles that go in, they need to know that they come from a cat. OK, so okay. they have I mean, this is not my image, right? This is yeah. from these guys from Symmetry magazine, which I love. Um, but Hawking's radiation is random. So it's a black body radiation. So what comes out is not a cat at all. Uh -huh. But the resolution of the information paradox can happen only if we can somehow recover the entire cat, which is the exact information that went into the black hole. And if we can actually study how this information is encoded inside the black hole in some microscopic degrees of freedom, like these quantum matrices, right? These matrices are actually elementary degrees of freedom of a quantum black hole. Mm -hmm. This is in anti de Sitter space, but in principle, you can do it in the Sitter space and with real black holes. And then the entanglement between what's inside and what came out through the evaporation process of Hawking's radiation. In this case, it would not be the original Hawking's radiation. It would be the actual quantum mechanical process of the evaporation of this state of D0 brains or some other objects. You can actually do a study this time evolution process using quantum mechanics. So that's what we want to do next with quantum computers, is actually take the ground state that we now have and evolve it in time under quantum mechanical evolution, Schrodinger's equation, and then see how the initial state is uh, compared to the final state. What kind of entanglement measurement do we get? So that's the big question, physics question. OK, I think that's uh, a, a good way of ending this uh, session. Thanks, Enrico. That was quite intriguing. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks for joining us. So. Um, just for your calendar, everyone, uh, no November 9th at 11 o'clock at the usual time, please, please mark uh, Chuck Horowitz's uh, talk, the C-Rex and P-Rex nutrient density experiments. So uh, I'm sure this is going to be uh, also pretty interesting. Uh, so until then, uh, see you. Thank you very much.